Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, just a quick reminder to ask you to please leave your questions uh, till the end. Please enter them in the chat. And uh, as well, please answer a brief survey after this presentation. This will let us know that you were present at rounds today. So I would like to uh, introduce our speakers today for our, uh, our rounds. These are rounds today are brought to us courtesy of the Division of Epidemiology. The title of the presentation will be Implementing Remote Capture of Patient Reported Outcomes to Transform Clinical Research and Care. Our speakers today are Dr. Sarah Ahmed. Sa Dr. Sarah Ahmed is a PT PhD. She's a professor in the School of Physical and Occupational Therapy, an associate member in Epidemiology and Biostatistics and Family Medicine at McGill. She leads a research program in person-centered digital health research and is a scientific director of the brilliant Learning Health Community Project. She's an advisor for the implementation of patient report outcomes for the Quebec Support Unit. She also conducts research aimed at improving health outcomes of individuals with chronic diseases. Her research addresses the implementation of patient reported outcomes and digital health solutions across trajectories of care to inform clinical and health system decision making. With others, Dr. Med is leading the development of the FRQS Digital Health Network. We also have Dr. Susan Bartlett, PhD. Dr. Bartlett is a licensed clinical psychologist and professor of medicine in the Division of Clinical Epidemiology, Rheumatology, and Respiratory Medicine at McGill. She is an associate faculty member of the McGill Schools of Physical and Occupational Therapy and Kinesiology. She is also an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins Medical Center. Her clinical and research interests focus on capturing and integrating patient voice in healthcare decision making and research and improving the measurement of patient reported outcomes in digital health. Her research has been funded by CIHR, the Patient Centered Outcome Research Initiative, NIH, NIH, and the Arthritis Society, among others. With Dr. Ahmed, she co directs the McGill Center for Health Outcomes and co leads the NIH. Promise Canada initiative. Thank you so much for being here today with us. And I think you got Dr. Bartlett, I think you're the first speaker. Yes, uh, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, these are our disclosures and the objectives of our talk today. And I'm gonna start us off by talking first about measurement because measurement really is at the heart of all that we try to do and that every improvement we're trying to make. It helps us to prioritize and to focus our attention and our activity, and it gives us better effectiveness uh, by targeting what we're trying to do, identifying what works, and also building in some accountability. Um, I think we're long past the point where we're asking, do outcomes matter? But we're really asking, which are the outcomes that matter? And we need to make sure that we're, in fact, measuring the right things, and at least capturing the things that matter to patients, measuring at them at the right times and in the right places. So that's what we're going to be talking a lot about today is what some of the developments have been in the field in general, and also what we're doing here at McGill to try and uh, build resources in the area of measurement. So if we start out by asking, how is the patient doing? Well, you're going to get different answers depending on what lens you're looking through. There's a growing movement right now in medicine that our systems need to be much more patient-centered. Um, and some will go as far as to say it really is the patient who needs to decide if a treatment is working, how well a treatment is working, but that's not the way that we have done things traditionally. So these graphs show you cumulative incidences of moderate to severe symptoms. These are cancer patients who are undergoing chemotherapy, and it's comparing their ratings of symptoms against their oncologists over a period of 25 months. And what you can see is the patients are in the gold and the clinicians are in the green, and the self-reports are just more sensitive to the presence of moderate to severe symptoms and to the changes in these symptoms. And in some cases, they're identifying the symptoms much earlier. And I think what all of this says really is that if we are truly interested in safety monitoring and we really want to understand treatments, we need to be asking patients and then listening to what they're telling us. 
So beyond helping us to understand how the patient is feeling and what they're able to do, this is where PROMS fit in, patient reported outcome measures. They play a vital role in learning health systems because they give us the patient perspective. If patients are the ultimate stakeholder, we can now see that we need PROMS uh, in all areas from real world evidence uh, to registries. We're finding the increasing use of PROMS in quality initiatives and benchmarking in individual care. And I'm gonna give you some examples um, because if we're really strategic in what we collect from patients, then we should be able to use this information in many, many different ways and across the multiple stakeholders who can benefit from the information. So let me start with an example of our neighbors up the road. In 2020, for the first time, Toronto General was ranked as the fourth best hospital in the world by Newsweek. Uh, it's a big deal. I was at Hopkins for many years, and at Hopkins, we were first in the world for 25 years. I can tell you it, it changes a lot of things. It brings a lot of resources to the table when you're recognized in this way. Um, one of the interesting things about UHN, how did they go from number 19 to number four in the report? It indicated that uh, UHN or Toronto General began collecting prompts systematically. Interestingly enough, I'm on the project uh, in which we were beginning to collect PROMs across all of the transplant clinics. But Newsweek noted in that report in 1920, and rather in 2020, that PROMs were playing an increasing role and they would feature more prominently in the rankings moving forward. In fact, here is their statement, and they talk about evaluating the implementation of PROMs in the hospital, and they do so by asking these questions. So they're, they're asking the things that are really important. I think, does the hospital have a uniform platform for collecting PROMs? How many PROMs are being collected? Are the PROMs data being shared? And with whom? Is it getting back to clinicians and patients for use in decision-making? Does it go to the public? Are the PROMs used in care processes to try and improve outcomes? So a variety of questions now being asked and we can see that the, um, the findings with uh, University of Toronto, uh, Toronto General Hospital rather, um, have, have held straight. These are the 2022 ratings, and here they are again, rating in the fourth position. So PROMs are going to be playing an increasingly important role. We are looking into the use of PROMs at MUHC right now. Um, and we're going to be starting initiatives to try and uh, do some pilot projects in different centers to raise awareness and, and increase comfort with using PROMs. Let me show you a few examples, though, of how they're being used elsewhere. So here's an application of PROMs at the population level. The UK has been at the forefront, really, of listening to patients and collecting PROMs, and they've been doing this for 20 plus years. But starting in 2009, all patients in the UK who were undergoing hip replacement or knee replacement were invited to complete a pro measure asking about their general and condition specific health. And if, although the patient participation has been voluntary, um, the response has been quite robust. So I'm going to show you some of the most recent results. And here talks about the participation rate. So it's about two thirds for hip replacements and about the same for knee replacements. And what patients show pretty convincingly is the value and the importance of these two operations. So it's not only the outcome of joint replacement, but also which hospital in your area has the best outcomes. And what that has led to is lots and lots of evaluation and research really to understand why the different hospitals in the UK are getting these very different outcomes and even why different surgeons are getting different outcomes. Here's an example from someone uh, that Sarah and I work closely with in the Promise Initiative, uh, Judy Baumhauer. And Judy was at the forefront of implementing PROMS at University of Rochester in the orthopedic clinics. And her motto was always every patient, every clinic, every visit. So the PROMS that they decided to collect were these three, physical function, pain interference, and depression. 
On average, it takes the patients about two minutes to co complete these. They complete them in the waiting room. When they walk into the clinic, they're handed an iPad and they just fill in the measures on the iPad, um, go and sit down. And by the time they're in the exam room with uh, Judy, she's got the results right in front of you. And I'll show you how Rochester is using these results. So um, every question, every patient, every clinic, every visit. And here's an overview of what recovery looks like and how they're able to describe it to patients. So let me break this down for you a little bit further. This is what's appearing, by the way, in the medical chart when she brings it up. Um, we've got the individual who is diagnosed with ankle arthritis. Uh, they, uh, their function, their pain continues to worsen over time. They're operated on. Um, we can see where they're having infusion and they're now put in a walking cast. They're out of the cast. They're getting some QT at this point and they're recovering and their function is considerably better. So, I mean, this graphic, you can look at it within about five seconds. You've kind of captured the important information that you want to see. But let me show you how they're using it specifically. So uh, first off, prior to seeing the patient, one of the first things that the surgeons will do is they'll look at the data. If it's the first time they're seeing the patient, they'll look to see where they are. Um, and they'll make some decisions about is, is surgery going to be appropriate at this time in combination with a physical exam, of course, um, in talking with the patients. Uh, do we think about this now? Can we put this off? How are we going to make those kinds of decisions? They're also looking at other information, but this is a really key piece of it, and I'll show you why. The first question that they can really answer with the data is, is it time for surgery? So you can see in this case, the person's physical function is now deteriorating, and it's deteriorating to the point where they're hitting a level that we would consider to be moderate impairment. It's a score of about 40, and I'll show you how we get those scores in a little bit. Then those preoperative scores can be used to talk with the patients because in the work that they've done, they've shown that there's a real sweet spot. If the patient's score is between 42 and 50, 50 is considered the normal range. If it's between 42 and 50, the person is actually doing so well that the benefits of surgery are probably not worth it to that person. In fact, people who had scores 42 and above who had surgery weren't very happy with the results. Conversely, if the patient had a score of 30 or below, those are the patients that were thrilled with the results. You've got people between 30 and 42, and that's where some decision making needs to be made. And that's where the conversations can take place. But those scores really do help anchor immediately whether or not this person is likely to be a good candidate for surgery and how happy they're gonna be with the outcomes. They can also use the information to compare not only among the different surgical techniques, what's getting better outcomes, but also among the different providers. And that of course gives them an opportunity to look and see, well, what's, what's happening differently, either with procedures or providers that's leading to these different outcomes. It's also really helpful for talking with patients. So for instance, when a patient asks, okay, so I'm getting my hip replaced, when am I gonna be able to go up the stairs? I live in a two-story house. And in fact, by looking at the data over time with their patients, what they've seen is the point at which people are able to go up the stairs is that score of 42. When do they hit a score of 42 after surgery? It's about 10 weeks. So here's another way that the information is really quite helpful in terms of being able to now start to provide information with a kind uh, provide patients rather with the kind of information that they really need to be able to evaluate, should I have surgery now? Is it the right time? How am I going to best prepare for my recovery? What can they expect? Um, here's trajectories of mood, of physical function and pain. And so what you can see is at the time of the fracture, of course, things are getting worse than the person has surgery and they begin improving and healing, but it's at about four months post-surgery when you see the biggest improvements in mood, when, when physical function has now reached about the normal range, 
and when pain is under good control. So again, very helpful in having conversations with patients and letting them know what to expect with all of this. That's the example at the University of Rochester. I'll just quickly go through another example. It was published recently in JAMA at Memorial Sloan Kettering. It's a, a joint um, RCT that was conducted with UNC. And the general approach was to include a symptom survey of 10 to 15 questions of the most common uh, symptoms. That, and patients could choose the symptoms that were most relevant to them. They completed the pros either on the web or on their phone. And then the scores were automatically sent to nurses. And there were alerts that were in place for severe or worsening symptoms. And generally, the patients were reporting each week um, with reminders that were sent to them by email or text or phone. And this is what they found in the most recent study that they did with metastatic cancer patients. Better physical function, better symptom control, better quality of life in the patients that were using the e-symptom reporting um, uh, uh, modules. Uh, now, that was studied to look at the impact on healthcare and healthcare providers and to see if there was an increased burden associated with this. And it was found, in fact, there was no increased burden. So this is really important. This is uh, metastatic cancer patients. There's even a signal that suggests that survival is longer simply as a, a function of this e-symptom reporting system. One of the biggest challenges, of course, is if you're going to be collecting PROMs, which PROMs should you be focusing on? And there are more than 10,000 PROMs. There are more than 500 that are being developed, they estimate, each week at this point. So which do you pick? How do you train clinicians? How do you actually operationalize this? Um, this was recognized as a, a, really a, a turning point or a tipping point by NIH about 20 years ago. And as a result, they made a commitment and have invested nearly $100 million in a system of patient reported outcome measures. It's a system that is largely freely available for anyone to leverage around the world. This is part of what Sarah and I have been involved with for the last eight years. And the system is known as PROMISE, the Patient Reported Outcome Measurement System. So I'll spend just a couple of minutes um, telling you about this system. This system. The thing about PROMISE is that it leverages modern psychometric methods. It's a very, very different approach to measurement. It's very different than the approach to measurement that I was taught even in graduate school um, not that long ago, but it's modern psychometric methods that really leverage the advantage of computer adaptive testing. So some tests are very wide. And when we say wide, what we mean is they measure the full range. If we're talking about physical function, we're talking about measuring people who really are quite limited and are in wheelchairs, all the way up to people who run marathons. Um, if you have one test that can measure all of those people, yes, you capture a full range. But what you end up doing is getting very low precision at the, uh, as a result of measuring this wide range. Uh, on the other hand, if we measure people within a very narrow range, what we can get is high precision, but you have to know where they fall in terms of asking the right questions, because if you're asking questions outside of the range, you're not gonna be able to capture the information that you want. And so that's where computer adaptive testing comes in because the tests are both wide and deep. What happens is with computer adaptive testing, the person is given one question, and that question is usually somewhere in the middle of the range. And when they answer that question, it then allows the computer to pick the next question to be administered. And that question will be within a much more narrow range because either they're a little above or a little below. From the answer to the second question, the range is narrowed even further. And why that's really important is because if we want to measure something like physical function or pain interference or fatigue, um, we can now do so accurately and very precisely using computer adaptive testing with as few as three to five questions. And it used to be 30 to 40 questions to be able to measure many of these domains. So 
Computer adaptive testing really, really has changed everything. And it's the basis of promise. Another important aspect of the uh, promise approach is the common approach. So everything is uh, anchored around a common um, measurement system. What I mean by that is uh, it's, these are all based on T-scores. So the mean of the population is always 50 for every symptom that you measure. The standard deviation is 10. That tells us that any score that falls between 45 and 55 is well within the normal range. And really, for most people, if they're falling between 40 and 60, that's not cause for concern. 68% of the population will have scores that fall between 40 and 60. Another advantage of computer adaptive testing is that we can actually um, have the norms targeted to people based on their sex, their age, uh, various different parameters. But in other words, with these promised scores, you can now look at the score and you instantly know, because if somebody has a score that's 50 or above, that's generally telling you that they're with uh, 45 and above, they're, they're really within normal limits, they're doing fine. If their score is between 40 and 45, for instance, and this is physical function, then we know there's mild impairment. If their score is between 30 and 40, that's moderate or severe. And if we're talking about symptoms, that's the ratings at the top. Anybody who's scoring less than 55, really, we're not worried about the symptoms, mild symptoms up to 60, moderate symptoms, 60 to 70, and severe or 70 to 80. So within PROMISE, there are now, I think, 550 measures for adults and children. Almost anything that you want to measure. Any symptom is probably going to be in the promise item bank, but you could be measuring one, you could be measuring five, you could be measuring 10 symptoms. You're going to interpret them all the same way. There are four basic kinds of promise measures. I'll just run by them really quickly. This is, this is just a domain or a fatigue, a symptom scale. So this happens to be the promise eight measure. And if somebody is scoring 50, then what they're typically answering is, I feel a little bit of fatigue. I have a little bit of trouble starting things because I'm tired. I feel a little bit run down on average. Uh, I'm a little bit bothered by my fatigue. Um, and my fatigue interferes a little bit with my physical function. So we can go back and we can actually figure out what people look like by their different scores. Uh, and this would be an example of somebody who's just well within the, the normal range. So that, that's an example of a promise domain measure. There are also promise profiles where they have put together groups of symptoms that seem to be the most important. Uh, the promise 29, the way I think of it is kind of the new and improved um, SF36. It's the one that is available without cost, first off, but it also took the SF36 questions, went back to patients, did a lot of work um, with that $100 million investment, uh, and gives you a profile. And it's a profile that's applicable across most of the chronic diseases. So for instance, I work in inflammatory arthritis predominantly, and we found that the PROMISE 29 uh, actually picked up on all of the symptoms that patients told us were most important to them. There's also PROMISE global measures for adults and for children. Now these are single item ratings and it's 10 questions. And the PROMISE global is asking about overall health, overall quality of life, mental health. Uh, so when people really have room for only a couple of questions and they're not interested in specific symptoms, then the PROMISE global is often a, a very good solution. These measures, by the way, are available in English and in French. Sarah's going to be talking more about this. Um, but for instance, the PROMISE profiles and the, and the global scales are available in more than 40 languages at no cost. And finally, um, one of the most recent developments has been the preference scores. The preference-based scores are important because they can help us to estimate the value of different treatments. So the EQ5D is probably one of the more widely used preference-based scores. The PROMISE um, preference-based scores now are coming um, into very widespread use. So 
So four different kinds or types of promise measures that are available. Um, one of the things that we've been most interested in is now that these tools are available to precisely and quickly measure patient reported outcomes, what do we need to do to really pave the way for their use in research and care in Canada? Uh, we have some additional considerations here, and I'm going to turn things over to Sarah and give her a chance to discuss those. Thank you, Susan. So building on what Susan just described and thinking through how could we achieve on a larger scale, uh, some of the examples that Susan presented in Rochester and elsewhere is we looked uh, locally to say, you know, what are the resources that we need to put in place to be able to really achieve um, the vision of capturing the patient perspective consistently as part of clinical research and in patient care. And that's where we established the McGill Center uh, for Health Measurement. And we, what, what we offer through there and the work that we're doing is really building on our learnings through our own work, um, that of others uh, that Susan presented in the examples uh, that she provided in surgery and in other areas, but also building on a legacy that we have at McGill in measurement. And uh, our legacy comes from the work of Melzac, of uh, Dr. Sharon Rodofny, of Nancy Mayo, um, who have really paved the way in terms of advancing measurement science. And so we're building on that to say, how do we make this um, applicable uh, for value-based healthcare if we truly want to integrate the voice of the patient into looking at outcomes and the effectiveness of treatment and resources? So I'm going to talk about three specific areas that we've um, addressed in order to make this much more of a reality uh, locally across different programs and hospital systems. So the first is the translations that Susan talked about. The second is thinking about the technology that's needed really to support this. And then finally, give you an idea of some of the questions we think through with some of the uh, clinical programs that we're working with in order to help them achieve um, the benefits uh, of using patient reported outcomes. So for the translations, uh, the, this, this uh, SPORE, the Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research of Quebec, actually funded the translations of the Promise Item Banks uh, that Susan referred to. And so we have them much more available now in both adults and pediatrics than we did when we first started around 2015. So this has really paved the way in improving access to many of these uh, measures and gaining the efficiencies um, that Susan presented of having the value of that common metric and being able to use computerized adaptive tests. So after addressing the translations, and this is work that we continue to do and validate, we turn to thinking about how can we make patient reported outcomes in general accessible and how can we leverage the state of the art and the over $80 million investment that the NIH made in Promise. And so in doing that, um, We've developed the McGill Health Measurement Center platform that allows us to, uh, through patient and clinician interfaces, uh, administer patient reported outcomes and share those scores back, and also make use of connecting into the PROMISE uh, computerized adaptive tests and, and suite of measures. The, collecting the PROMS is one step. The next step is really thinking about how their scores are used and who needs to see them and then how they're connected in with patient care, either within research or within clinical care. And so within the platform, there are other modules, uh, including educational modules, self-management modules that link the patient reported outcome scores uh, to decision making. I just want to take a second and, and re remind ourselves that, of course, anything that we measure, we want to make sure that it's good quality data. And so when we're doing this work, we're really thinking about, and, and Susan mentioned the proliferation of measures, uh, one of the, the, the dangers is making sure that the measures that we're using really do have support for the reliability and validity and that we can trust the scores and that they have the properties, for example, if they're going to be used to measure change, that they are sensitive to change or there is support uh, that they can capture the changes that we're expecting to see. 
The roadmap to develop the McGill Health Measurement Center actually started uh, with work we did with a national uh, group across Canada, uh, where we had uh, expert presentations uh, nationally um, from policymakers, patient partners, researchers, as well as from the NIH uh, group to come and, and brainstorm with us, what do we really need to prioritize the integration of patient-centered outcomes and accelerate um, their use across uh, research, clinical care, and policy decision making. And from there stemmed a series of uh, publications that helped define specific areas that are recommended for us to think through in order to scale up the use of patient reported outcomes. And you can access um, that series here. It was published in 2017 and covers all the areas from thinking about sustainability, uh, how do we think through what measuring what matters and when and how is it relevant for value-based value healthcare, uh, clinical applications, their use in self-management support, population health, and so on. So we really tried using the expertise of our uh, committee and national network to build on all of these areas and put the pieces uh, together. Through that, it's helped inform um, the various ways that we work not only in our own work, but over the years, we've uh, different groups have reached out to support their thinking through uh, implementation of PROMS in their clinical sites. And we do this either through um, consultation, meeting with the different groups at different times, offering training um, in small groups or through larger workshops. And then, of course, helping to access the technology and put it in place in a way that meets uh, the needs of the clinical uh, workflow, depending on the context of the program and the patient population. So a lot of what we focus on goes through from selecting the right set of proms and making sure all of the stakeholders are around the table and thinking about that. So you can imagine if it's in an interdisciplinary program, um, how the scores will be used might be a slightly different. So how could we meet the needs of all the stakeholders? Going through iterative development to tweak the platform if they will uh, use the platform uh, from the McGill Health Measurement Center, and then thinking through implementation and evaluating the success of integrating uh, PROMs within research or clinical care. I'm just going to briefly share a couple of examples um, through from um, some of the programs that are working with us in the McGill Center for Health Measurement and using the platform in these three areas to give you a sense of sort of what are the different considerations depending on the context that we think through. Um, so for example, in chronic pain, it's an interdisciplinary program. The objective of that program is to use uh, patient reported outcome measures, not only for patient planning at an individual patient level, but also for program evaluation. And so in this scenario, if we think about where the data is being collected, they're outpatient, it's in the home or the clinic, that has different implications for, for how we collect the data, who needs to see the results, it's the health providers and the patients so that they can use it and share decision making during the visit, but also looking at the data at an aggregate level um, so that QI teams and managers can also use the data to inform service delivery, allocation of resources, and then, um, we, and then to support all of that, of course, the data will be used either during the visit or for reporting. Same thing in the other two contexts. So in the spinal cord injury, it's inpatient, it's slightly different. We have three different sites. In one of the sites, the uh, who needs to see it is, needs to be connected to the EMR. So we have to take that into consideration in the development of the platform and in the workflow. Um, and how they will share it with patients and families in order to plan discharges and services in the community. So linking it to the discharge plan. A very different example is uh, using it in a university wellness uh, center where it's directly uh, providing um, resources to students in terms of uh, wellness around lifestyle and mental health. So this is sent out through email, student listservs, and students and wellness providers need to see the scores, and then that needs to be linked to a bank of resources for them. So each of these have their own considerations in terms of how, when, uh, and how the scores are used and linked to decisions down the road. Um, and each of those requires sort of uh, working together to think through the plan and how the uh, system will work. 
just for the purpose of time, because I believe we need to end at quarter two, I'm trying, I'll try to move a bit faster through these in case there are some questions we can have time for discussion. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of, of more points about integration in clinical care. Uh, Susan showed some really great examples about the benefits of being able to share the scores during the patient visit. And the workflow really to achieve that benefit really needs to think through all of the steps from selecting the proms, thinking about how effective exchange and the feedback of the scores between clinician and patient will occur, um, using the data to actually inform decisions in the treatment plan. So making the links between the score and those treatment or management plan selection, monitoring to see is the plan being carried out and then we the the hope is that that would lead uh, to improvements in patient outcomes. This is an example in chronic pain uh, of how we thought through of who needs to do what when. So the clinical team, which includes a nurse, a psychologist, uh, and a physician, the team sees the patient together. Initially, the nurse does a triage, decides if the patient is eligible for the for the program. If they are, then they're referred in and they receive um, a prom that is set up by the administrator, essentially just by adding the patient's name and email and making sure that the date uh, that the patient gets the prom at least one week before their, their visit. And the hope is that they complete it. That's the ideal situation so that the scores are made available at the patient visit. If it's not, then the backup is for them to complete it at the clinic and having the, the, the technology available for them to do that. There's also paper backup uh, if needed because having the scores eventually is better than not having them at all. And then those scores are shared during the visit. And then there are follow-up uh, uh, prom measurement that's done before discharge to decide whether the treatment plan stays the same or whether uh, changes need to be made. So it just gives you a sense of, of the different steps uh, to think through. In terms of using the scores for decision-making, this is an example of some of the reports. Um, and really, they're tweaked based on the preferences of the team and what scores they need to see. So for pain, the body map is really important, seeing that alongside the scores. Um, and then having the visual in terms of looking at changes over time. So whether there's a, a decrease or an improvement in depression, fatigue, anxiety. Uh, this is just another example of how it's seen. So in spinal cord injury, uh, we defined a core set through a, a national consensus Delphi that we had done, and this is the core set. And essentially the team can look with the patient to see are there changes over time in each of the domains that are important for spinal cord injury. And then this is a university wellness example where um, there's some questions that are asked around diet and, and uh, lifestyle habits. And then the patient, the promise uh, measurement system around the different domains. And depending on how they respond, then there's recommendations for different services if there is an area that's identified as being problematic. I'm just going to end by talking a little bit about how PROMS fit in the larger picture. So we recognize that often, um, when especially when we're moving towards personalized care, and you, you heard a little bit that Susan and I work in digital health. So we are thinking about how PROMS fits within sort of the digital health ecosystem and with other measures. What outcomes are explained or, or personalization of care is explained through variability in PROMS versus other uh, clinical outcomes. And so we are working with different teams. This is an example of the brilliant uh, learning health community where we're putting in place digital tools for patients as well as clinicians to think about how PROMS will be collected and how that data will be combined with other sources of data, including wearables, including uh, standardized clinical assessments that are uh, conducted in, in physical therapy, the performance-based outcomes and so on, and how we can um, construct that data in a meaningful way to follow patients through the continuum of care so that we can truly look at uh, how we can personalize care and provide patients with what they need along their their care uh, journey. 
So I'm just going to end there. Uh, this is just a, a sort of a synopsis of the different uh, resources and tools uh, that we're trying to make available uh, through the McGill Center for Health Measurement. And really, our goal is to continue to work with teams to generate evidence that PROMs do make a difference when they're included uh, within clinical research or care. And then the other part of it is we are also working with clinical teams uh, to collect data on the French translations uh, to continue to validate uh, the French uh, promise item banks. And it provides excellent opportunities for, for training students and new investigators and others who are interested in, in measurement. So thank you very much. And I uh, will stop there and uh, see if there are any questions for Susan and I. Thank you so much. Really uh, excellent. Thank you for the uh, the really excellent presentation and for all your great work in this area. We have a few questions that are coming in. Stephen, you have a question. Stephen, would you like, we have a few minutes. Would you like to turn on uh, your microphone and maybe ask the question? Sure. Great stuff. Uh, congratulations to both of you. I think this is really, really important work and it's great to see that you've been able to bring this up to Canada, export it from the U.S. My question is, uh, 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 one of the, while well, digital health and digital tracking have huge potential, one of the, the big challenges is how do we keep patients engaged, uh, keep them tracking, keep them providing data to make sure, number one, that the information we have is as unbiased as possible, but two, that they can benefit from this as, as much as possible. And dropout rates are typically a huge challenge. Well, what sort of things do you do to support engagement and adherence? Um, and the last question, uh, do patients have access to this data outside of their clinical set outside of their clinical uh, um, visit so that they can not only uh, uh, be part of the community in providing the data, but also uh, feel that they're benefiting directly from this information in terms of their own care. Great question. Um, yeah. I was going to say, so Stephen, as usual, you, you get right to the heart of the matter of what, what really um, is important here. And it, it's one thing to be able to collect the data. Now, it was challenging to figure out ways to be able to uh, routinely collect the data with as little burden on people um, using the best measures and the fewest number of questions. Uh, but the real art of this comes with the understanding of human factors, all of which you outlined so nicely. So it's not enough to just have a good system. It's not enough to have measures that are relevant and important to patients and be asking the right questions. But uh, um, more work is happening right now to try and understand how we do use this information. One thing's for sure, if you collect data from patients and you never talk to them about what you've collected, they stop completing the forms. They do that very, very quickly. So just simply reviewing it with them is very helpful. But as we now think about getting the electronic health records here in Quebec, uh, a very important consideration will be the extent to which um, PROM data collection is integrated into the EHR, can be made available instantly to patients and to clinicians um, to be able to review and to look at the trends that are happening over time. So the visualization, the, the access, all of these are key, key pieces to, to making sure that we are able to continue to collect information and have it available in ways that is maximally useful for the most number of people. Yeah, I would just echo what Susan is saying, and I'll say it's a work in progress, but this is where the engagement and working with the patients and, and the clinicians very early on and thinking about what's in it for them in terms of what do they wanna see and will be most helpful is really key. Um, for motivating them. And, and while there are some core principles that repeat themselves, there are certain nuances or, or preferences that can make a huge difference in them going in in terms of, you know, seeing a score linked to some other outcome that's really important to them or um, some recommendations or resources that they really feel is important, especially um, for patients. That, that resource piece is really important is, can I link that to something else that will help me? Um, and, and Stephen, I think, you know, we have a lot to learn from you as well and the work that you're doing right now in terms of how do we apply gamification to motivate people um, to be interested in self-management and 
and interested in uh, plotting and tracking their results over time. So uh, we'll be very interested, especially your work you're doing with the veterans right now uh, to see what we can learn from that. Uh, thank you so much. There's lots of questions coming in. Uh, Dr. Sasha Bernatsky, go ahead and ask your question. Hi. So then for people who um, would like to switch over from SF36 to Promise, and, and I mean, you can do that for, for, for various parts of the things that we're wanting to measure, but we've got 20 years of data using another measure. What do you see as the commitment in terms of resources? So that would be like, the time and the money it would take. Uh, I'm wondering if, if you sort of need to, to collect both measures for a while, try to calibrate. And then when you're doing your analysis, you know, as you go on through time, perhaps for a while, you're going to have to do uh, a different sensitivity analysis to be sure that, that, that you've accounted for that fact that they're, they're different measures. So time and money that you think it might you want be. Me to answer that, Susan, or do you want to? Yeah, yeah. So, so somebody else has thought of that, uh, Sasha. Great question. Um, that it, I'll, I'll just start off by saying that the Promise Item Banks is based on taking the best items from all the legacy measures and creating those item banks for a given domain. Um, so, for each of the domains in the SF thirty six, um, they're targeted by the Promise Item Banks, and so there's an initiative called Presetta Stone, exactly getting ready uh, for, for um, settings, research or clinical where they wanna transition from the legacy measures to the promise item banks. And Presetta Stone actually does the mapping between. So if you have older data that you need to use and then want to switch to promise, the Presetta Stone could be used um, to do that um, mapping without you really needing to do anything. So it gives you the equivalent score on both scales, the SF36 original scale and uh, the Promise uh, metric. Um, and I believe it's automated now within the Promise API, but I'd have to confirm that. Well, would that also Sasha, work if your, yeah, if your collaborators didn't want to switch over? Exactly. Well, then, yeah. the, the process is called crosswalking and a good deal of that has already occurred. The good news for you and I is that the people that were most interested in this came from the rheumatology community. So the, the key rheumatology measures have already been crosswalked back to promise so that uh, you can convert the scores either way and readily compare them. Thank you for your answer. And thanks for your question, Sasha. Uh, Claire godal Sibiot, would you uh, like to ask your question, please? Hello, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I I'm doing a service research and I was wondering whether you're aware of, of using prompts to improve health service delivery, uh, but not like, I guess there are studies where in surveys of things like that, we use prompts, of course, but like the more um, routine way you just presented for health, for um, clinical care, like are there uh, uh, health systems that continually uh, uh, um, uh, ask these questions to people in order to improve the organization of care? Thank you. Well, uh, uh, thank you for that question. That's uh, very, uh, it's something that we keep an eye on. And there are several examples. I believe, Susan, you gave a couple um, of the UK and looking at hip and knee fracture. Kai Hai here in Canada is also doing the same thing. So they are uh, looking at standardizing. I think they have an initial six to eight hospital systems uh, where they'd like to standardize the PROMs that are used in hip and knee with the purpose of improving health service delivery and being able to do some of the comparisons um, that they've been able to do in the US and the UK in terms of patient um, function and outcomes uh, after hip surgery. Um, the other big initiative is uh, the OECD. So the Economics Forum um, of the World Health Organization have an international initiative and Quebec has just joined on where they've defined a core set of uh, outcomes to collect in primary care with the idea of improving primary care delivery and being able to compare across uh, not only different provinces, but different countries. So those are, you know, to, to look for and watch and see um, what comes out of that in terms of the actual use of those scores for making some of the decisions. 
And then I think we could find a lot of smaller examples in, in cancer. So in Ontario, um, Susan presented uh, the university health network, but they've been collecting uh, proms and cancer care for a while now and have been using it in terms of, um, I believe, even benchmarking uh, some of the, the services that they offer um, to, to patients uh, with cancer. So it's it's a great question, Claire. It's interesting because I mentioned that the UK was really at the forefront of doing this at least 20, 25 years ago. Um, and we were very much, you heard about the legacy of measurement uh, at McGill. Um, but then all of a sudden, from being very far behind, the United States just rose to the forefront in the last maybe 12 years or so. And one of the key reasons for that is because what they started doing was requiring patient reported outcomes as part of performance indicators. So if, if you want to get reimbursed by the insurance company or by Medicare or Medicaid at the top levels, you have to have the patient reported outcomes that support that you're giving the best care, that along with experience measures. And that, that really changed everything in the United States. And uh, I think is a key reason why the EHRs already have PROM sets built into them. Thank you for that. Uh, Marie Brossard, Racine, can you ask your yes. question? Yes, thank you for this great talk. Um, I have very practical questions regarding um, the use of the PROMIS and other PROMS measured in pediatric population. <clears throat> First of all, like, are you aware of like a specific age range, you know, or, or is there like a cell, like um, I'm thinking of younger children who might not be able, able to, to complete those. Is there like a parent version of self, like I know it, we wouldn't be able to call them self-reported measure, but are an equivalent that you're aware of? Yes. And thanks for giving us the opportunity to mention that. So um, Chris Forrest at CHOP in, uh, at University of Pennsylvania has, um, well, he had more than 50 major studies going with patient reported outcomes. He is truly the guru on this. And he's done patient reported outcomes with kids as young as three. Now they're not filling in forms, but they're responding to questions. And he's shown that it's valid and reliable. Um, there's a, a at least 40%, I would say, of the promise measures are for children with, and they're validated in the different age ranges. Um, and there are the proxy measures for parents as well. So there's a really robust measurement uh, a subsystem that's available, uh, at least within Promise, for being able to capture these kinds of outcomes. And uh, if you go to the um, CHOP website, or you go to the Promise or Health Measures website, um, you'll find a lot more information on what's available for kids. Perfect. And I have a, um, uh, just another quick question in terms of like its applicability to different condition in, in, in pediatrics population. I can conceptualize how this can be used, you know, in, in, in patient with like an acquired condition such as cancer or post even like traumatic brain injury. But are you aware of these have been applied also in developmental uh, form of chronic conditions such as autism or uh, oh, yes? <clears throat> If, so if you go to the health, in fact, I was reading okay. that yesterday at the Health Measures website about how it's now being used in educational settings for exactly these kinds of um, purposes. We talked about PROMISE. PROMISE actually is a family of measures. So PROMISE includes NeuroQual, ASCII, uh, the NIH toolbox. Um, they all work basically on the, the same principles, but uh, Marie, it sounds like you may be as interested in the NeuroQual measures as the Promise measures. And yeah, that's what I picked up by quickly going on the website, but uh, yeah. it's yeah, a there's, whole there's, there's, And question. there's great information about how to tease out which would be better for my purposes. So happy to direct you to that more um, specifically. But we'll great, thank you so much. Thank you. We have time for one last question. Dr. Ariane Morelli, would you like to go ahead and ask your question, please? Sure. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Always such a pleasure to discover the kind of excellence that exists at McGill that we uh, that we discover in uh, Grand Rounds and other venues like this. Um, I just wondered if there had been, uh, you know, a follow up of PROMS measurements over longer periods of observation and whether in the short run, 
uh, that improved proms were actually associated with shorter length of stay, uh, less readmissions rates, you know, like the sort of harder outcomes of um, morbidity and mortality associated with interventions. And then the other question was, you know, proms repeated measurements over, you know, longer periods of time. So, so I would say that the short answer is yes, and we can direct you maybe to some of those uh, studies, Ariane. Thanks for the question, because I think that's really important. In terms of longer periods of, and yes, it, it's, for example, hand surgery, so predicting um, a certain recovery, return to function after hand surgery. Length of stay, it has been shown um, in the ankle foot with Dr. Judy Bomber that uh, uh, Susan presented. Uh, where uh, length of stay was associated with patient reported outcome scores, but also the complexity of the case, so adjusted for other uh, factors as well. Um, in terms of the length, that's that's probably where we need to generate more evidence is to be able to show beyond, uh, you know, and I guess it depends on what post-surgery we're talking about, but beyond, um, I believe the longest that I've seen is six months. I don't know, Susan, if you've seen longer than that, six months post-surgery. Um, well, I mean, Ethan Bash in, in oncology has been looking as long as seven to 10 years and mm. found differences in survival. Um, so I think it's, it, it, one, one of the things that's happened is there's an explosion of publications, an exponential explosion of publications, particularly after, over the last three to four years on these kinds of outcomes. It's a bit tough to keep on top of all of it. Um, but if you have a specific uh, condition in mind that you're thinking about, we're happy to um, link you with the resources for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bartlett, Dr. Ahmed, for really this terrific presentation and for participating in discussion, answering all these questions. Uh, thanks everyone who's joined us today and uh, thanks all of those who were engaged and involved in the discussion. I think that was uh, really interesting questions um, that uh, really will help, uh, help us understand this further. Congratulations on all the work you've done. And I do hope that we will see you back at Medical Grand Rounds and uh, perhaps with the other teams at McGill involved uh, in, in the work that you're doing. So very special thank you for being here today. And thanks for everyone, uh, especially those who participate in the discussion. It's greatly appreciated. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.